welcome back, okay. everybody. We're here for, with part two with uh, Monish Pabrai and Guy Spear. Thanks for coming, guys. Let's jump right into question number one. Buffett has recently, he gave a talk and he was, uh, he went through how lucky we are today as investors that we can build our empire at a moment's notice. We can pick, you know, we can create it and tear it down for almost no trading costs. And what, uh, he, he compared it to how Carnegie or Rockefeller back in their day, they were stuck in either the steel or the oil business. Uh, you know, because that was just where their wealth was concentrated. But since we have the stock market, we can build our own empires at our at a whim. Is that how you guys view your own portfolios? As if it was a uh, an empire that you're building and setting up for, you know, the however future amount of time. Take that question first, and uh, I I'd say that uh, it's a very uh, insightful comment by Warren, and uh, clearly uh, having the ability to shift around. Uh, uh, capital and such the way we can with public markets is a huge advantage. The problem is most humans uh, hurt themselves more uh, with that flexibility than they help themselves. And so, for example, you know, recently uh, at Fidelity, they did a study of, uh, you know, they have all these millions of brokerage accounts and they just studied the self-directed brokerage account, which uh, individuals had performed the best. And uh, what they found is that the people who had performed the absolute best were individuals who had forgotten they had accounts at Fidelity. So these were accounts where they had made a bunch of stock picks, and then for 5, 10, 15 years, uh, no one had done anything with that portfolio. And there's a profound lesson in that. And even, even when I look at, uh, look at uh, Babrai funds, uh, you know, the thing is that I, I have a... Uh, and uh, an asset class investment, which is not publicly tradable. And that is the, uh, the general partner of the Pabrai funds. The general partner of the Pabrai funds only invested 100,000 uh, as a, a co-investment with eight other investors in 1999 when the investment began. And from then until now, uh, I have not put any more money into a general partner. It's only the hundred thousand that went in, and uh, the the stake uh, that that general partner has in Pabrai funds is you know well north of fifty million, you know approaching sixty million, and uh, so you know the it went from a hundred thousand to sixty million in fifteen years. It was not a publicly tradable vehicle. Thank God it was not a publicly tradable vehicle. You know God knows what I would have done with it if it was you know I had a, I had a court coming at me every ten seconds. And uh, so it, it is a huge advantage if you can basically, in effect, turn off the ticker. And, you know, I tell Guy this, and I think Guy is probably much better at this than I am, is that uh, I look at my portfolio today and I look at these businesses that we own. And I think the absolute best thing I could possibly do uh, in terms of managing this portfolio is to take absolutely no actions no buys, no sells, no actions for 10 years. I believe if I did that for 10 years with the current portfolio I have, it, it, it you know, it's sitting at 700 million today. I think it'd be several billion uh, in a few years with taking no actions. And unfortunately, I'm not that smart. So I will not be able to do that. And that's such a pity. If you just need to get into cycling just a little bit more, that's all. <laughs> um. You know, I wrote a letter to the FT some time ago when I uh, saw there was um, the Hershey Trust wanted to sell out of their um, ownership of Hershey's business because some consultants had told them that they need to be diversified. And, um, you know, uh, businesses are the wealth creation mechanisms of society. And uh, I think that Another hedge fund manager whose name escapes me, well known, based in New York, talked about how you, you sort of have to buy your portfolio every day and you have to think as if you're buying your portfolio every day. And I just think that's really hard to do. And as Monish says, you end up engaging in all sorts of trading costs and doing all sorts of silly things. So it's really good to, to go to the opposite extreme and treat yourself, even though you have the ability to do it, to pretend that you don't and pretend you're a bit more like those guys, those robber barons who were stuck in the steel industry or the oil industry. Um, 
you know, I, I think a lot of these questions, again and again, what comes up for me is that uh, there's a part of our uh, brain that wants to rationalize and feels like we can find an optimal solution. But we're actually much better off saying, understanding that we're animals with all sorts of mammalian and reptilian instincts. And what we really need to do is just manage those and use as many tools as possible to do it. Great. Let's, <clears throat> question number two, and this is for you, Monish, and it's, uh, it's about your book. Um, and in it, you talk about this family of, of the Patels, and that it's the ultimate American dream story. Uh, I think a lot of people aren't really familiar with them. Could you just give like the Cliff Notes version of, of the Patels and, and how, they've, how they, uh, their approach fits with your heads I win, tails I won't lose much uh, outlook? You know, um, I'll just give you a quick anecdote before I dive in. But my my wife recently set up a uh, uh, a solar business. She installs uh, solar so rooftop solar solutions for businesses and uh, homes and so on in Southern California. And uh, recently, she's uh, gotten a whole bunch of Patel clients, uh, and one's referring the other, and so on. So she's got a nice kind of uh, uh, you know. Uh, I would say uh, pipeline of Patels, and what she commented to me, commented to me is that she has never had uh, any clients uh, uh, in with other ethnic groups and such who've been as astute uh, as the Patels have been. Um, they were very quick on the uptake. Uh, they very quickly understood the the tax benefits and so on. Uh, very quickly able to understand the uh, the economics and such. And uh, were uh, the uh, the toughest negotiators uh, in terms of pricing and so on, uh, but at the same time uh, extremely fair uh, to deal with and, and such. So uh, she uh, she's uh, thrilled dealing with the Patels, and uh, and and I would say that uh, the Patels uh, basically are just almost inborn uh, instincts of great business. Uh, owned over the centuries, and uh, generally, they uh, when they came to the U.S. and they identified the motel uh, industry, it, it appealed to them from a number of fronts, mainly because they needed a place to stay. They couldn't get uh, jobs because they didn't have good qualifications in a motel. You need a lot of labor. They could put the entire family to work. They could uh, drive the cost down, and they became the lowest cost operators. And in fact, since I've written the book, uh, which is like seven or eight years ago, I think the market share of Patel owned motels in the US was probably hovering around below 50% when I wrote the book. It's approaching close to 60% now. And in fact, they've moved up market into the Marriott's, the Hilton's, the Westons, and they're, they're uh, taking market share on that front. And that is going to continue just because they're better operators and uh, they are smart about the way they allocate capital and such. So uh, that approach, which is, you know, you eliminate or minimize downside risk and you focus on upside is a very powerful construct to use in business as well and in investing as well. That's a good segue okay. for question number three. Uh, and that has to do with this idea of risk versus uncertainty, which I think is kind of a key point in, in understanding uh, Dondo investing. Uh, why do people seem to get those two confused? And, and why does it seem like Wall Street particularly hates uncertainty? Yeah, I think Wall Street wants things on a platter, and uh, you know, I had uh, I had made an investment. This is the first investment uh, the funds had ever made in 1999, but they got going, and it was a company called uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And Silicon Valley Bank was a pretty well-run bank in the Bay Area. Uh, it might still be around. I don't know if they got acquired or, or such, but uh, their model was that they made loans, uh, asset-backed loans, to venture-backed. Uh, uh, private companies, venture back companies. But every time they did those loans, they took warrants in addition to their normal uh, spreads on the interest and so on. And so uh, in the middle of 99, they were sitting on a huge basket of warrants, probably north of two or 300 companies, maybe more. Uh, but there was no disclosure around those warrants. And so you could not uh, figure out what those warrants were worth and such. But they were worth above zero. And, and of course, we had the whole dot-com, you know, fires raging and NASDAQ climbing. And so I found this vehicle where it was trading at a modest uh, premium to book, which was a pretty 
reasonable, we might even say slightly undervalued valuation for the core bank operations with absolutely no value for the warrants. And I was looking for a way to play the madness of the internet uh, without any downside. And Silicon Valley Bank just seemed like the absolutely perfect way to do that. And I did. We, we made that investment. And a few months later, we had a double uh, on that investment. And, uh, and uh, we sold and moved on. And uh, that was classically high uncertainty, low risk. And Wall Street has trouble uh, pricing uncertainty. And uh, so if you're an investor who can understand the difference in the two, between the two, uh, you can take advantage of that. I would just tell you, Jake, that um, I, I, I resemble, well, I guess I am somebody who has a, had, I think, in the past and even and today, a lot of difficulty distinguishing between risk and uncertainty. I think uh, my nature is uh, to be fearful of potential loss in a much greater way than some other people, certainly more than Monish. Uh, that said, there are some people who uh, don't fear. They almost go for situations where there's a loss. They tend to find those people in casinos, for example. But I think that um, uh, what happens to me is that I, I see... Uh, I see something that is either, is either risky or uncertain, and often it's not clear when you first look at it. You really have to pick through and go carefully through to understand which it is. Uh, but what happens to me in many cases is that I don't want to push, push the research and analysis forward to try and get to a place where I can really distinguish is it risky or is it just uncertain, and I end up then seeing anything that's uncertain is also risky. And it takes a certain kind of mind that I think is partly innate and it's partly through experience of having done it to identify these kinds of risky slash uncertain situations and then to work at it to see if there's some way to really sort of remove the risk, even if one can't remove the uncertainty. And I think that um, uh, my luck uh, f is that from time to time, or, or almost regularly, uh, Monish has helped me to see that. And uh, and it's not it's not as if every apparently risky some risky uncertain situations stay risky, uh, but some you get through to a place where you say, well, actually, this is just an uncertain situation. I would tell you that that's just my nature, and I have a hard enough time overcoming it. I think that what you have on Wall Street is you have people who are accountable. You go into a management meeting or in a research meeting, you say, well, I'm looking at dot, 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 and, and there's an immediate revulsion factor, and, you, and there's all sorts of reasons why people don't want to take the analysis further. So it serves as an interesting guide, actually, that just about any situation that looks uncertain and is difficult may well have some meat on the bone if one's willing to drive it through just a little further. Okay, this next question, number four, is a little bit of a tough one, and I, I didn't want them to all be softballs for you guys, uh, but... <clears throat> this one is around, uh, if you look at both of your 13Fs, there's a fair amount of overlap these days. And I, I mean, I'm sure that comes from working with each other. Is there any concern at all about uh, the potential for group think or, and how would you know at what point maybe your sounding board becomes compromised? Don't throw anything at me for asking the, the hard question. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know that guy files 13Fs. Uh, I've never seen a 13F from Guy, so maybe he can chime in for a second. Guy, do you file 13Fs? I have not yet filed a 13F, but I will file one at the end of this year. So, okay. Uh, but and, maybe uh, from... Yeah, that that and, uh, said, my annual report ha does have, because I am international accounting and reporting standards, IFRS, I need to, I have to do some kind of balance sheet in there which lists some of the positions so that's probably what you're referring to yeah and then the 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 second issue is that yeah i have i have seen guy's portfolio uh in his uh is his annual report uh there is stuff i throw up uh over in that portfolio and i tell him i read it and i threw up and i tell him why i threw up and then next year the report arrives and it's still in the portfolio and then again, I tell him I threw up again and it just continues to stay there. And uh, so I can tell you this uh, quite uh, confidently. There is a massive difference between Guy's portfolio and my portfolio. And, uh, and I think there's a difference in performance as a result as well. And I'd love to hear Guy's take uh, on when the stuff I'm throwing up over is going to be wiped out so I can have better health. 
Well, my my claim, Jake, is that um, well, first of all, there's there's well, I I can I can give examples of situations even where I was. I'm thinking of um, uh, a company called Interactive Brokers, uh, which I remember talking to Monish about, and he ended up buying it, and I didn't. I, I happened to talk to him about it. I thought it was interesting, but I didn't want to buy it. There are a large number of situations where, uh, like I said, I'm either throwing up over it uh, or for all sorts of reasons I decide not to buy it. Or sometimes there are structural reasons. We have different the different configuration of custodians, and sometimes there, there, are, there are positions that Monish can buy that I'm unable to buy, uh, and it's it's been um, – uh, the reverse, but but I would put to you, Jake, that if you looked at our combined portfolios, my my claim is that you wouldn't throw over the up over the positions that Monish throws up over, but you would throw up over the positions that I throw up on, <laughs> over in Monish's account. Um, yeah, I, I you know. I, I don't feel any compulsion to agree with him. And actually, I would tell you that he likes it much more and I disagree with him. So, <laughs> You guys probably have a, a rare dynamic as far as that goes. Let, let's, get your, let's get your book recommendation then before you have to go, because I know Guy was so eager to hear it. Yeah, so uh, I read a book recently called uh, Being Mortal, and that's written by Atul Gawande. It just came out, and I think it's, it doesn't have anything to do with investing. Uh, though I think it tangentially and all these things help you with investing. Uh, I think it's a wonderful book for any human to read, you know, young, old, because you're going to encounter that with relatives or, or friends or yourself in terms of uh, end of life choices and such. I think it's extremely well written. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a great book. Uh, another book I read uh, a couple of years back, which I thought was really exceptional, uh, was a book called Give and Take. And, uh, you know, it separates the world into three kinds of people, givers, takers, matchers. And uh, the world really kind of conspires to help you uh, if you take the plunge and become a giver uh, without looking for rewards uh, for doing things for others. Uh, so those are two, uh, two books I think are wonderful. And of course, my strongest book recommendation is The Education of a Value Investor uh, by an obscure person named Guy Spear. Well, that wasn't too shameful of a plug, so that was good. Well, guys, I really appreciate your time, and uh, <clears throat> it's been fabulous having you on here. It's really special to talk to you. Likewise, we, uh, we enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. All the best, guys. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>